Perfect. <clears throat> so we like to begin these sessions with a land acknowledgement. Um, Code for Canada is headquartered in the traditional shared territory of many nations, including the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, I'm joining you from the city known as Vancouver, which is on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. The land we live on is still home to many diverse First Nations, <clears throat> Inuit, and Métis peoples from across Turtle Island. I want to share my gratitude for the ancestors who cared for this land for a long time before me. This acknowledgement is also a reminder of the discriminatory, racist, and colonial practices that have been a lasting legacy and can you continue to create barriers for Indigenous peoples and communities in our city. I invite us all to ask ourselves, how can we turn our recognition into action and become partners in caring for recognizing Indigenous contributions and committing to engaging in decolonizing practices? If you're not familiar with the history of the land you're on, I encourage you to get curious. This is from a website called native-land.ca, or there's an app called Whose Land developed by a Haudenosaunee developer. Next, um, as people trickle in, I would love to hear a bit about who's in the room. So with virtual events, it's hard to feel that connection to everyone else who's joining you, but we're really thankful for the time you've taken out of your day to, to spend with us. Um, Happy to share a little icebreaker with everyone. So I invite everyone to, in the chat to share your name, you know, where you're joining us from. You could share a land connection, um, a land acknowledgement of where you're coming in from, um, and something that's bringing you joy lately. So I'm Jennifer. I'm the communications coordinator at Code for Canada. And something that's bringing me joy lately is being able to visit my family again and pet my dog. <laughs> So as we move on, continue to welcome everyone to share their um, stories in the chat. I'm going to jump into a bit of an introduction to Code for Canada, and then we'll pass it on to our speaker. So Code for Canada is a national nonprofit on a mission to leverage technology and design for the common good. What does that mean? Well, what we do is civic technology um, and digital government. So the civic technology side is the use of technology for the public good built by communities, residents, nonprofits, and tech and design professionals. Um, our civic tech network is a great example of this, where we have uh, local community groups run by volunteers across Canada who work on projects um, every Tuesday for their hack nights. As well, part of our mission is to support digital government. So digital government, how we define it, is the use of digital technologies as an integrated part Uh, to create public value. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this basically means we support governments in their journey to become more digital and provide services that meet resident needs. So our programs enable governments to deliver better digital services and empower communities to solve civic challenges by connecting residents, government innovators, and civic technologists to work together to build a better nation. So we have a couple programs to help facilitate this. Our big program is the fellowship. It's a nine, a 10 month program that connects tech and design professionals, embed them into the government departments where they work on a project together. As well, we have our civic tech community network, which is a network of local organizations run by volunteers um, who work independently to solve challenges connected to their local city. We have an education program where we provide trainings, and uh, educational resources to public servants on how to work in a more digital way. As well, we have a usability testing service called GRIT. Um, it's a service where we connect creators of technology, public facing technologies with residents um, and often underserved populations to test technology products. And lastly, we have Civic Health Toronto. Uh, we're actually in the process of redesigning this to expand it more nationally. Um, we connect local governments with civic and tech professionals to help them uh, in the local government journey. Um, and this is just the beginning. So if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to reach out to our partnerships at codefer.ca to learn about 
a bit more about what Perfect Canada can offer. Uh, with that, that's my introduction, so I'm happy to pass it off to Andrew. Awesome. Hi, all. I, uh, I recognize a few names in here, so that's that's pretty cool. Hi, Steve. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to be talking today about this idea of designing trust relationships in research. Um, and this is actually like tied in a little bit to a project that I've created myself um, called NoSeed. Uh, so there, there will be, you know, a slight kind of pitch for that. Uh, don't feel like you need to use it in any way, shape or form, but you know, just a, a forewarning that that's coming. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just give a quick intro and then we can dive in. Um, so the overall plan for today is to, you know, introduction to myself. We've been partially through the introduction already where for Code for Canada. We'll be talking about designing participant experiences and ways of approaching that, things to consider and similar. Um, and those of you who have a service design background, this will, I think, actually be quite familiar to you. Uh, and then I'll give a quick introduction to NOSI and we'll have time for Q&A later. I think there's like a, there's a, a question form um, that everybody can submit things to, which I don't actually know how to access. So that'll, we'll, we'll figure out, uh, <laughs> figure that one out. I'll put it in the chat where everyone can, can submit their questions. Sweet. Um, awesome. So this is me uh, about a year ago before COVID. I look so happy. Um, and this is my son, Emil, uh, who is not here, but he may barge in at some point. So if uh, another speaker joins, there may just be a very quick interruption. Um, I am originally from Toronto, but I'm currently based in Copenhagen. Megan, um, and I've kind of been all over the place. Uh, I was with IDEO for a little while. I was with the US Digital Service with the Department of Defense, um, which was super interesting and also super stressful, as I'm sure many of you uh, civic, civic tech folk can uh, commiserate with. Um, after that, I was with New America. I've done some work with CID and uh, currently run my own consultancy where I work with a bunch of different folk from Mozilla, IKEA, OpenTrons, uh, which is a lab robotics company, all that kind of stuff. Um, you can contact me at any time, and I'll also provide some additional kind of contact information, office hours stuff at the end of the presentation, uh, if that's of interest. Um, okay, so very, very quick intro to NOSI. Uh, NOSI is an informed consent platform that I developed uh, basically after going through countless design research trips and always, always having problems and challenges with, uh, with informed consent. Um, keeping track of the forms and making sure that they were filed, making sure that we had some strong mechanisms to keep in contact uh, with our participants. And so NOSI is a platform that makes this a little bit easier. And we will talk a little bit more about that uh, after the meat of the conversation, which is the designing participant experience. These are some puffins, which are beautiful. Um, so research participants have more rights and greater anxieties than ever before. Um, and this is kind of coming at us from two different angles. One, there's increasingly, and, and this is a good thing, um, increasingly strong legislation out there that are protecting uh, participant rights and um, user rights when it comes to personal privacy. Uh, the GDPR is the one that you like most people know about, but there's also different legislation, for example, in Canada around Pepeda in California with the CCPA. Um, and it's likely that we're going to be seeing some good privacy legislation coming out of the Biden administration in the United States as well, where there currently isn't a strong sort of like privacy basis. Uh, yeah, th there's not a strong privacy basis for um, on the federal level. And so when you're doing research with folk, you need to make sure that you are respecting their rights, both from a legal perspective, but also from an anxiety perspective, folk are, they're increasingly aware that they're basically being tracked, that their data is being exposed. And so we're constantly reminded of this every time we sign up for something with terms of service, we see it constantly with cookie reminders um, for, for different applications that we might be accessing. And so there's a greater awareness amongst users and consequently as researchers, if we wanna get the best information and make sure that we're entering into a sort of responsible um, relationship with our research participants, we need to be demonstrating that we're, we're doing that in a responsible way. 
Um, so generally speaking, the recruiting cycle that we see when we're engaging in a research practice is looks something like this, um, or at least it's supposed to look like something, or it looks something like this if you talk to a research ops person or if you're laying out something in a linear fashion. Um, you identify who you want to talk to, you contact them, they respond, they consent to, to talking to you, you schedule time with them, you interview them, and then you transcribe and synthesize those findings and figure out some way of communicating that outwards. More frequently, it, it actually ends up looking like this, where there's more kind of cyclical relationships tied to that. So you might constantly or a couple of times reach out to the person to see if they're willing to respond, if they're willing to talk to you. Um, you might need to remind them that they need to fill out the consent form, or for that matter, they may uh, be asking if that's something that you have, which isn't always the case, unfortunately. Working with them with scheduling and then doing follow-up interviews afterwards. Um, and this is something I've recently experienced where I've actually recontacted uh, uh, interpretive interview participant several times because <laughs> the information that we found from him is so valuable that we need to keep keep adding dimensionality to it. Um, and then of course, we're all, or many of us, I believe are familiar with the synthesis process, which can be a complete tangle in and of itself. And now with the advent of GDPR and different privacy laws that are require greater participant control of their data, we need to be providing stronger mechanisms for participants to contact researchers so that they can modify and adjust their consent if they change their mind, if they have a uh, a change of heart, a reason why they might be fearful, why they might feel they need to consent prior to the interview and then want to withdraw that because they felt threatened or something was revealed that they didn't intend in the interview. All of these kind of things might come up. Um, and so we need to provide strong mechanisms as researchers in order to make sure that people like our participants are empowered to, to do so. Um, Part of the challenge, though, is that as research programs get a little bit more complex, we also tend to see uh, a bit of a division of labor in order to make sure that the pipeline of research is actually fulfilled. So we might have administrative or recruiting services actually engaged in identifying, contacting, engaging in the sort of response and uh, follow up factor, managing the consent forms and scheduling participants. And the researchers might only be engaged in the actual sort of initial identification of the type of participant they're looking for, the research design and research study, um, and then the interview and transcription process after that. And as any of you have engaged, who are engaged in government uh, likely knows, you know, there's the situation of when you have a bunch of different teams or a bunch of different individuals engaged in contact with a single person, things fall through the cracks. Um, and so this, this is a challenge that we need to address. Um, unfortunately, that's just talking from the perspective of the research participant as envisioned by the researcher. The reality is the research participant has much less agency and less, much less insight into what this process is intended to do um, and where they fall into it. So if we were to look at the participant experience, they're getting some kind of contact, either a cold email or an introduction. They agree or refuse to engage in the study. Um, they may have some questions. They're asked to fill out a legal form for this thing that they don't really understand the value of necessarily. They agree to schedules and potentially compensation, and then they speak with the researcher. And then frequently they don't hear anything back. They don't necessarily learn anything of what the study is supposed to do, what happens to their information, nothing. And so the participant experience is perceived as something that's very extractive and quite fraught. Um, so if we were to look at each of the different stages of this participant experience, you can see some of the concerns that start to emerge. So if you get a cold email, like, is this a scam? Who is this person agreeing? You know, I'm still worried that this might be a scam. You know, how quickly do I actually need to respond? The researcher might be very anxious to get the recruiting phase done. You know, for a participant, this might just be another email in their inbox. Um, they're asked to fill out a form. They hear about photos. They might not know the name of the company. So they're anxious to fill out this legal form. They're trying to understand compensation from the perspective of their time and the, the potential risk associated with this conversation. And then when it comes to actually speaking with the researcher, you know, it's not always the same person uh, that they engaged with. 
maybe there's multiple people in the interview when they were only expecting one person. So that sort of expectation setting is, is pretty fraught as well. Lucky for us as re researchers, each stage is an opportunity to build trust. Um, and participants who feel safe and secure in the research process and the time leading up to that research process are more likely to be engaged, be open, be helpful. And ultimately that leads to much, much better research uh, and research outcomes overall. Um, so yeah, the first part of every interview is focused on building rapport with the participant. So, you know, that sort of like five, 10, 15 minute warm up period that we often engage with in an interpretive interview. Um, that's something that we can actually extend that trust building process like much, much earlier and build a stronger foundation if we pay attention to these different aspects or touch points um, that lead up to a good participant experience. So this is where the uh, you know, service designy approach um, starts to come into play uh, in that if we start, if we think about the participant experience, we can think about it at a couple of different layers where a couple of different things are going on. There's a front of stage where like, these are the direct touch points where participants are engaging with us um, around communications, introductions, the researcher themselves, the brand of the organization that's engaging in the research, response times, all of these sort of core experiences where folk um, are having a direct sort of contact with the researcher and that's constructing their experience. But the backstage is the thing that's sort of, you know, enabling all of those kind of things from identification, data storage and similar. Um, and then finally, we have norms and rules. And, uh, you know, one example of those norms is the discussion around uh, land acknowledgement, for example, at the start of this, uh, this talk. And, you know, that's a norm that's increasingly uh, we're engaging in, in, in having any kind of discussion in Canada or presentation or similar. And that's something that needs to be acknowledged. So front stage. Um, these are the artifacts and directs agents of participant experience. You know, there's obvious parts like clear forms, friendly researchers and safe environs that create a good participant experience. But the less obvious ones tend to be quick response times, obvious mechanisms for feedback and the brand identity of the research team. Um, I can say at IDEO, it was incredibly easy, uh, generally speaking, to have conversations with experts to reach out to different folk who, um, you know, as an independent consultant, it's a little bit more difficult to reach out to some of these individuals because they might not recognize the brand and not sort of immediately understand some kind of transactional benefit from uh, having a conversation. The infrastructure experience. Uh, so yeah, the infrastructure of the experience success at this stage relies on coordinating the backstage team and the infrastructure. This can get to data storage. So making sure consent forms are actually stored in a consistent place potentially using a service like NOSI. Um, the staffing and experience of your research ops team. So how familiar are they with this process? How willing are they to engage in some of the complexity that an individual participant might have? And then what's the project budget? That also has an impact on the experience that participants have because if you have a greater budget, then you can spend more time focusing on these individual pieces. And then the actual system of that experience, and these tend to be the norms and rules that dictate how we need to structure and design our individual participant experiences. Um, so data privacy legislation is a big one. Um, here in Europe, the GDPR is that sort of dominant uh, force, and there's certain things that you need to adhere to, um, including the ability to withdraw consent, being very clear about individual cases where consent is given, not having a generalized consent form, but rather creating consent forms that are specific to the type of research that you're doing at that point, um, and making sure that uh, consent can be withdrawn as easily as it is given. Um, so those are some of the norms or legal norms that we then need to design our research operations around. Um, and ultimately, when participants see those things, they tend to feel more comfortable uh, in, in actually providing truthful and meaningful and deep information, which gives us better results. Um, unfortunately, each project is a little bit of a different, different exercise. Um, so, you know, if you're working with people in the medical field, in the States, you have to go through HIPAA. Um, there's different European um, regulations around specifically how you might engage in, uh, in that research. And you know you need to you need to 
go through and take the time to actually design that individual experience before you're going into designing the overall uh, research as well. Um, however, there are some best practices and useful tools that we will take a quick look at. So I would argue that if we break down the individual parts of that research experience or that, sorry, that uh, participant experience, um, we can see opportunities to create a good toolkit um, with which people might engage. And so clear communication, simple consent, centralized scheduling and developing rapport, these are all individual points within uh, the participant experience and the participant journey that we can develop interventions into specifically. So from the perspective of clear first communication, this is very much the sort of like front stage, backstage and uh, norm building side as an aside. So we'll go through sort of each of these toolkits from that perspective. Um, so the artifact that starts most people's experience is an email or a phone call for actually recruiting them. You may have spent a ton of time thinking about who it is that you wanna recruit, how you wanna bring them into the process, designing the, uh, the moderator's guide, all of these kind of things. But from the perspective of the participant, this is the first time they're actually engaging in the research process. And so they're gonna be curious and, and want to understand more. Um, so you need to provide a clear introduction with context, speak to some explicit reason as to why they're being contacted over somebody else. Um, and set expectations about what will come next. This really sort of forms the core of uh, their first experience with you. And this is just an example of like a cold reach out email um, that I, I wrote as an example for a, a post, which I'll share later. Um, and then on the backstage side, there's certain things that you can do to improve this experience and make it easier as well. So having ready to go email templates means that you can react faster um, when participants respond. This is really critical because the response time is ultimately part of their experience. So if you're quick to respond, they're going to be more, uh, more willing to trust your capacity to engage with them. Um, establishing why you should be trusted, trusted by referencing affiliations, having public content and all of that is also a really good uh, way to go about it. I've often found that if I send out um, you know, a survey or a bunch of recruitment emails, I'll suddenly have a bunch more hits on my company website, um, Stupid Systems, which is a kind of actually a terrible website, but it lays out who I am and what I do pretty coherently. Um, and so people can reference that to just add that sort of degree of social proof um, into it. And then just having all the additional infrastructure that you need ready to go. Um, that can be in terms of doing additional introductions, making sure that you have a quick intake form, making sure you have the scheduling forms ready, all that kind of stuff. Um, it just makes for a better experience overall. And then finally, norms and rules need to be adhered to. Um, communication standards will differ across groups. So for example, the land acknowledgement is uh, a good example of that thinking about how your communication comes across um, in terms of the language that you might use, the greetings that you might use, the way that you sign off, all of those kind of things. Um, when I was working in the Department of Defense, there's the sort of V slash R very respectful or very respectfully that everybody signed off on. And when you include that kind of, uh, that, and are also conscious of some of the weird, weird details and in jokes that are associated with that sign off, it's more likely to be recognized that you are part of a particular group or at least indoctrinated into the culture of that space. Um, and then, and this is actually not super well known, but the core technology stack um, that you use for reaching out can have implications for how you, uh, basically whether your emails even get through. So making sure that you take the time to check the DMARC score, check the various sort of email score or spam scores that you might have associated with the email address that you're sending out from is quite significant. Um, and I, I've seen some, some clients of mine have had some difficulty with that in the past. So we ended up sending uh, recruiting emails from my email instead of theirs, uh, which has other implications as well. Um, there's a blog post that I wrote uh, that you can take a look at. It's pretty easy to find anatomy of a research recruitment email. This provides some templates and some easy ways to get started in this. Um, simple consent experiences. Sorry, that was minimized. Um, so front stage, clearly and simply communicate the ask um, around the consent form. Just be very specific about what it is that you need. 
provide a mechanism to be contacted if there's sort of additional information that they might request. Um, always provide a mechanism to withdraw consent. Uh, this is the case, like this is particularly enshrined in the GDPR, but actually in the Canadian context with the PETA, um, like you also need to provide strong mechanisms to withdraw consent with the exception of like, there's certain uh, legal reasons why somebody might not be able to, but um, it's, it's a requirement basically in both cases. Um, yeah, and just recognizing that like for some people the consent form or aspects of that consent form, it, like it really doesn't matter. People will gloss over it very quickly and they won't care. They won't even remember that they signed it. For other people, it can be a complete deal breaker. And so just making sure that you have um, these different pieces all sort of wrapped up. Backstage wise, just making sure that you have a strong way to manage signed consents. Um, this is usually where the process falls apart. My sort of, uh, the, the sort of genesis story of NOSI as a, as a platform was, uh, my team losing a large number of consent forms, thankfully just media release forms, but uh, <laughs> consent forms and, and not being able to use the media that we had taken um, on, a, on a trip in London, which I was very upset about. And that was kind of the most egregious example of it. But um, just generally speaking, I have very, very rarely seen uh, organizations that manage consent well and so this is this is your opportunity to really sign shine um have a consistent place to store reference and destroy safe consents including the media associated with that consent um and yeah just making sure all the media is tagged and similar ideally this is also a good opportunity for anonymization um or at least pseudo anonymization of the media and data as well and then finally norms and rules there's different expectations around photography and audio recording, let alone video in all different cultures and societies. Um, and just being cognizant of that when you're going in, especially for field research or field research in a country where you haven't necessarily been before, talking to a fixer or finding somebody who can coach you on some of those cultural nuances is significant. Always, always, always have a backup um, and realize that if you lose that consent, like you can't go ahead and use that data uh, or you need to reach out and get get that consent again, which is an argument for having some of this managed in a digital context. And then understanding regional laws and norms is vital in navigating liability concerns and, and also developing rapport because the person that you might be speaking with may have much greater understanding of what those laws are, or they're more indoctrinated into the norms of consent and privacy so that they might push back. I recommend using NOSI. That is no longer the homepage for it, but uh, yeah, no C. It's a great app. Um, centralized scheduling is also a very helpful thing to do. Um, simply put, like, don't make the participant think. If you can make this super, super easy and not have a back and forth from an email perspective, that's ideally the way to go. Um, always have at least a couple of scheduling options or a tool that can automate scheduling and provide a reminder one to two days before the research session. These are always like these are just fundamentally very good rules to go by um i personally like calendly there's a couple of other tools that you can use for uh doing this kind of scheduling but just make sure that there's an easy way to do it and then make sure that you embed some of your boundaries within that so if you need know that you need to complete your field research in two weeks then make sure that all the date options are within that two week period so that there's not necessarily a back and forth associated with that um and that's just part of expectation setting Using a centralized tracking solution is generally a good way to go. Um, this is an example of a recruiting sheet that I used for a research project, I think a year or so ago, um, where I was chatting with a bunch of different open source, um, basically like open source support communities. And it was actually a very difficult project to recruit for because you were reaching out to people via their online handles. Um, and so there, the sort of demonstration of that social proof that we were people who were worth talking to uh, was unbelievably challenging. Um, but we, I, we also ended up talking to some pretty, pretty incredible folk. Um, 
And so this spreadsheet was a, that initial sort of centralized tracking system that we used to figure out who we were talking to and, and who was the sort of point of contact for that. Um, I think I have this as a template on my site, but I will double check that afterwards. Um, and then also there is a scheduling and calendaring feature hidden inside NOSI, which doesn't work currently because um, it's very janky. Uh, and then just general norms and rules, always be punctual, um, just show up at the appropriate time. Um, this isn't necessarily, sometimes punctual will mean five or 10 or 15 minutes ahead of time. Sometimes it will mean just on time. Sometimes it is not putting too much pressure on the host. And that's something that you'll need to navigate. Build buffers into your research schedule so that you can get between different places within that sort of understanding of, uh, that understanding of what punctuality means for your research participants, giving yourself time to travel and then just generally be a little bit early so you can suss out and navigate the situation. Um, a particular sort of story from that, which I, I still kick myself about was we were doing sort of in, in home interviews and uh, recording sessions and this person lived at an address where the address was on one street, but the entrance was on another street, and it took some serious like street view and Google map navigation to figure out where the hell the entrance to this building was. Um, so be a little bit early. Uh, yeah, and I think that template is at this link. So planning your design research trip, um, as well as just some general tips in and around that. And finally, developing rapport. Um, so paying attention to the individual artifacts of attention are significant. This can be, for example, like if you have a recording device, um, always sort of be honest about that recording device, put it out, but also try to make it uh, as subtle as you can. I have one of these guys, which it's like a Sony IC something or other. The audio isn't great, but it's very small. It's unobtrusive. I can indicate it as like a physical object that I'm using to record. It has a light that indicates when it's recording, but it also just fades into the background. And so these kind of artifacts go a long way for creating a sense of confidence um, and trust with the participant. If you have a giant DSLR and you know one of those massive Zoom recording devices, then people will tend to focus on those when they're talking about things that are potentially uh, you know, vulnerability inducing or what have you. So just thinking about how you design that experience for the participant goes a really long way. And also having different artifacts like tools or templates, worksheets that you can go through, stuff like that. It helps a lot. Um, pay attention to the performance of openness and attention as well. So where is the participant looking? Are they making eye contact? Are they looking around the room? Are they looking down? Are their hands crossed like this? Are they sitting in a more open position? These things can just help you understand where the participant is coming from and understand also how to sort of shift the situation so that they feel more comfortable or, or also so you can back off a little bit if you're verging into territory that is maybe not great for them. Um, and then finally, always schedule in specific time to build rapport. I generally suggest about 10 to 15 minutes because you can you know, do the intro, you can talk about where you're coming from, you can hear a little bit about their story and where they're coming from and warm up to the cadence of the conversation and then uh, go from there. And you know, this, is, this tends to be the thing that I think researchers practice the most, um, but it's still something to, to be conscious of um, and to design. I personally always like to write specific interview guides for each group um, that I'm speaking with, also sometimes each individual. Um, so thinking about those different sort of categories that you're, you want to talk to and then subdividing from there. This often means writing actually a relatively large number of moderator guides and just sort of cross-referencing which core research questions you're addressing in each guide, um, but this can help. Also treat these moderator guides as things that are more checklist than a direct script. Um, the worst experiences are things where it, it feels like you're just going through this rote interview where you're not really connecting with the person that you're talking to. Rather like allow yourself to dive down rabbit holes with the participant because it's those rabbit holes that tend to be the things that are the most beautiful. Um, and then, you know, as much as you can within the context of the study, iterate on your research guide. You can't always do that in the context of, say, like academic or social science research, but you can do that in uh, design research or, or private sector research or 
for that matter, public sector research because you don't necessarily have that sort of sign off um, tied to it. Uh, so each interview becomes an opportunity to iterate on the quality of the next interview. And then debrief with your team each day uh, to explore what worked and didn't work. And so these kind of practices, both management and documentation wise, can really help improve the uh, experience for participants when it comes to those touch points that we discussed earlier. Um, and then norms and rules, again, be sensitive to cultural norms and needs. Um, I, you know, in, in my case, like I was uh, the only male on a team doing research with Planned Parenthood patients um, who are, you know, mostly women and being the only guy on that team meant that there were certain situations, certain conversations that I had to be very sensitive around or not participate in. And so just understanding where those pieces come into play uh, is really significant. Um, also looking for things that might be triggering for individuals. Uh, if you're working with veterans or if you're working with uh, folk in the military, certain types of questions, certain uh, lack demonstrations of a lack of understanding or a lack of empathy might be triggering for folk. Um, and that's just the thing that you should try and educate and engage with as much as possible. Um, so yeah, taboo subjects or behaviors within certain groups. Uh, and then always be willing to extend additional privacy to the participant. This is fundamentally the thing. The participant is in control of their data, their information, and their privacy ultimately. And you are an agent in sort of ensuring that that's the case. And so as researchers, you know, because our practice can be quite uh, extractive in nature, um, and it can be the power relationship between participant and researcher is, is generally um, out of sync, then, you know, we're responsible for making sure that the privacy right that participants have is always respected. Um, these are some really good books to take a look at. Uh, Yan Chipchase has a couple of really good ones. Um, Designing Social Inquiry was uh, my, my initial qualitative research textbook from the University of Toronto. And I think that one, KK, KKV is still sort of making the rounds. Um, all of these are great. Uh, I think Steve Portugal is also on this call. Anything he writes is really good as well. And I highly, highly encourage you to check out Steve's stuff. Um, so yeah. I'll highly recommend all these uh, all these books. So I'm going to talk very quickly about NOSI. This is a slight spiel, but I'll try to sort of zoom through this relatively quickly so we can do some questions. Um, yeah, we we addressed all of this. This is usually the consent form that you'll find online. This is not acceptable, um, and it also wouldn't hold up if it were ever challenged by a participant. So that's a that's a thing to keep in mind. You can do research better. NOSI was meant as a Trojan horse for better privacy practices of research. That was sort of fundamentally the idea that it started with and that continues to be the idea. Um, this was also the context where like, uh, I, NOSI is a solo project. Like I'm the only person working on it. Um, you know, I, I do use a research design research as a, as a job uh, as well from a consulting perspective. And so NOSI as a tool for me was like that I built the tool for me initially, um, but I also wanted to embed better privacy practices in, uh, in the community. Um, so we'll just quickly flip through these screens. You have an organizational context So Stupid Systems is my company. These are some of the example uh, projects underneath. Each project you have forms and participants who are part of it. You can generate the forms and create them in any way. It's, it uses Markdown right now, but this is gonna get redesigned at some point. Um, you can also create uh, translated and multilingual forms. You add a certain number of consents and then those consents can become visible um, or summarized in individual uh, participant, when the participant fills out the form. Participants see this, so they can select the language of the form um, and they see all the sort of core things that you need to include as part of a consent form. Either their information is filled out and they just confirm it or they can fill it out if you're sending them a, a sort of just a standardized form as part of the process. They can see specifically what it is they need to fill out and they can switch between legal and plain language uh, from a comprehension perspective. Then they just sign, they follow up with their contact options um, and they finish. After that, they get a receipt 
where they can access the document and change their consents, um, delete their data, contact the researcher, download their consent forms as a PDF, all that kind of stuff. And then as a researcher, you get a summary of what that participant uh, filled out. So you, you know, you can share internally or you can collect audio only, but you can't uh, share it. You can try it out, nosu.com slash join for a free account. Um, and also uh, you can use the code research trust for three months free at the full access level, which gives you different things like unlimited consent uh, or unlimited consent form sent out, the public consent form link, all that kind of stuff. And then finally, Thank you for listening to me. Uh, slightly rambly at the beginning, but that I think is just how I start. I start talks, and you know, also with COVID, I haven't been outside in a year and a half, so I'm, it's weird to talk to people, except I can't see anybody. Um, so you can find my writing. I write a weekly newsletter, usually about something design related, um, at andrewlb.com. If you want to do office hours, uh, I have that there. And I, I actually saw a couple of folks who I've already spoken with on this call as well. So hi, Morgan. Um, and then you can find me on Twitter at ReadyWater, where I just post random, random stuff. Uh, and you can always email me as well. And thank you.